Right, thank you very much indeed, uh, Anne, and a great thanks to the Libyan Cardiac Society for giving us the opportunity to talk about quality in cardiac surgery. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Mangouche for uh, agreeing to, uh, to, to give the talk this evening. And also to the expert panel, um, Dr. Adil Dayoub, uh, our friend Dr. Um, Peter Wilson from the UK, Adil from Canada, and Dr. Brahim Isbeda, I think, uh, I don't know whether he joined or not, Dr. Sassi is out of the country. And I tried to speak to the two Khalids, but uh, I wasn't able to go through to them, uh, eventually. So uh, all welcome. And Amr, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Rida. Uh, thank you for the society for uh, giving me this opportunity uh, to give this talk. Uh, today we'll talk about uh, quality uh, assurance in cardiac surgery. The objectives of my talk to raise the awareness, uh, especially among our junior about the importance of quality improvement uh, programs in cardiac surgery. Uh, and also, uh, in the last part of the talk, we'll talk about uh, the importance of uh, establishing a national cardiac society and uh, trying to persuade uh, the society to uh, make an effort to do to do that. Uh, quality of uh, of care usually uh, defined as the desired uh, health outcome for. Uh, the individuals and the society as a whole, which is consistent with the current uh, professional knowledge. Uh, and the cost has to be factored in this uh, care as well. And any intervention uh, to improve the outcome, it has to be safe, uh, effective, efficient, uh, patient-centered, and equitable. Uh, Cardiac surgery is the most well-developed uh, specialty in terms of uh, measuring and improving quality of care among all other specialties. Uh, when, when we come and assess the quality of care, we have to look at uh, the following modules. Uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, we have uh, three modules, which is the structure, process, and appropriateness of care. And in the left and the right side, we have an outcome and efficiency. Uh, and these on the left side contribute uh, to the outcome and efficiency uh, through performance measure, change in our practice to achieve the desired outcome. And any intervention, as we said, we have introduced, we, 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 we introduce it has to be uh, a valid, actionable, uh, measurable, very important, cost-effective, and it has to have a positive uh, impact on the patient's care and outcome. Otherwise, we should not consider it and it will be a waste of time, effort, and money. I will go through each uh, module. I will start with the structure. Here we are referring to these uh, points. Uh, hospital facility. Uh, staff competences, volume of surgery, and participation uh, in registry. Ho hospital facility, you are talking about the infrastructure of the hospital in terms of design, um, uh, facility, uh, equipment, and a lot of doctors, they are not aware of the background uh, effort put through architectural engineers and uh, health planners to build a health facility. Uh, and we're not aware of the, the presence of international uh, standards for this uh, health facility. Uh, and each country has its own standards, which should be implemented uh, when you build this facility. And this goes through the size of the, of the OR, the space for the bed, uh, relation of each department to others, taking consideration the flow of uh, work of the patient, going through um, 
electricity, uh, water supply, gas supply, uh, uh, humidity and ventilation, uh, medical waste management, uh, also uh, infection control consideration. All these uh, have standards and the current situation in Libya, to my knowledge, only maybe one or two hospital which have a reasonable number of these standards. Uh, the rest, either in the public or private sector, uh, they lack these standards. Uh, staff competences here, we are talking about uh, staff knowledge, uh, um, medical skills, communication skills, teamwork, uh, management, uh, professionalism, and health advocacy. And this should be taught in undergraduate and postgraduate training and uh, the staff here we are talking about surgeon, intensivist, uh, cardiologist, uh, ICU nurses. Uh, they should be uh, certified and have credential to do their uh, job uh, specification, uh, job uh, description. Uh, the same we have problem with this aspect in Libya. In, uh, in the Libyan Speciality Board, we have no cardiac uh, surgery uh, speciality, uh, and most of the people who are, uh, and this goes uh, through the other units as well, in terms of uh, intensivist, uh, ICU, uh, ICU nurses, uh, perfusionist, uh, anesthetist, uh, a lot of them, they have no uh, certificates and no credential, although they are practicing uh, in the private and public sector as well. Uh, volume of surgery, uh, the linkage between uh, good outcome and the number of surgery is well established in the literature and uh, the society have recommendation about the number of cases each unit. The European Association of Cardiothoracic Surgery uh, recommend to perform at least 500 cases open heart surgery uh, per year and at least 70 uh, cases per surgeon per year. Again, in Libya, we have issue with this as the number of surgery uh, is well below what's needed. Um, the last point in the structure is the participation in registry. Um, uh, I know there is some junior with us, so forgive me, I'm, I'm going to elaborate on this. Registry is an electronic database uh, where uh, the demographics of the patient, uh, risk factors, um, patient uh, admission, uh, intervention, and outcome is captured in this registry. And the registry can be... Uh, uh, either disease specific or related to a society like uh, cardiac surgery. Uh, it can be local, just capturing uh, the data for the hospital, or it can be regional, multiple hospital, or national or international, like the European Association of Cardiothoracic Surgery, surgery database. We'll talk uh, uh, more detail about registry uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, the second uh, module is the, is the process. And this is what uh, matters more to the health profession in terms of uh, uh, doctors and health allies as well. Uh, as what we do with the patient from, uh, from the admission or outpatient admission to uh, uh, intervention, either surgery or ICU stay, hospital stay, Everything we do, it should be evidence-based practice. Uh, and they will go through uh, a list uh, of uh, uh, practice, which recommended by the American Heart Association, American Cardiology, uh, uh, American uh, College of Cardiology. And I, I highlighted with the green, uh, the class one uh, recommendation. Uh, heart team is very important uh, to achieve a good outcome. And, and in this heart team, it should uh, have a surgeon, uh, an anesthetist, uh, cardiologist, especially interventional cardiologist, 
uh, an intensivist, and they should meet regularly to discuss all cases uh, which should go for uh, cardiac surgery. And the document in the notes of the patient, uh, the plan, uh, the planned procedure for the patient. <clears throat> Informed consent is very important uh, to build the trust between the medical team and the and the patient and his family, and also to avoid litigation at the end of the intervention. Uh, Pre-admission clinic and a, and, uh, and a checklist. Uh, this is important <clears throat> to invite the patient and the outpatient uh, a week or two weeks before surgery and to go through uh, thorough uh, uh, history, taking history and physical examination and to review the investigation, which is um, to document the patient's uh, <clears throat> surgery, date of surgery, hematological investigation results, images, uh, pulmonary function test, uh, including uh, coronary angio, uh, risk assessment for the patient, blood and blood uh, products availability, and uh, antiplatelet and anticoagulant taken and time being stopped. Also to fill if the patient being through the heart team and the decision taken there. And any problem with this uh, or any variation of this result, it has to be documented an action uh, taken and who did the <clears throat> take the action to date and sign the document. This is to avoid mistakes and near uh, miss and cancellation of uh, cases. Anesthetic outpatient clinic for uh, high risk cases is very important uh, for the same reason uh, to establish a standardized protocol either for the whole unit or for the <clears throat> Uh, for a team, and this is, uh, uh, it should be a sheet, uh, and most of it, it will be uh, ticking boxes to make it easy to follow, and uh, it should be filled during uh, the journey of the patient uh, in the hospital, and uh, everyone should contribute into this uh, protocol, including uh, the junior doctor, the operating surgeon, the anesthetist, the scrub nurse, the intensive care team to the discharge and follow up. And uh, this standardized protocol should be uh, <clears throat> organized in a way, <clears throat> if you have a registry, to follow the same uh, uh, way, the layout of the registry to make it easier to capture this data later. Uh, patient safety checklist. Uh, this is recommended from the WHO, and it has uh, three columns in this sheet. On the left-hand side, we have a, a sign in, time out, and sign out. Uh, sign in, this should be filled when the patient comes to the theater for surgery, and uh, this handover between the ward nurses and the anesthetic team, and they should identify the patient. Uh, uh, document the operation needed to be done, the site, the site of surgery, uh, <clears throat> readiness of the patient in terms of fasting, uh, hair removal, uh, glycemic control, infectual, infectious status of the patient, and the anesthetic readiness of the anesthetic team and their monitor and their machine and their drugs, and the assessment of the airways, if any high risk uh, allergy for the for drugs, availability of blood and blood products, <clears throat> etc. It should be documented. Uh, time out, this should be filled uh, just before uh, uh, opening the skin. <clears throat> and um, everyone should contribute into that, all the teams, including surgeon, anesthetist, uh, scrub nurse, perfusionist, and each one should uh, uh, introduce uh, the member of his team, uh, summarize the operation need to be done and any special uh, exception or needed uh, deviation from standard surgery should be mentioned. Uh, <clears throat> the anesthet should uh, confirm that uh, his machines is ready, and the lines uh, established uh, and uh, the ACT, the blood and blood product readiness, 
the scrub nurse should uh, also search in that uh, her uh, instrument are complete and trial uh, diathermy uh, so uh, <laughs> defibrillate defibrillator are ready and tested the perfusionist also should do the same regarding his bypass machine calculating the flow size of the cannulas etc uh, when the, the, done patient before the patient leaves the theater, the last column sign out should be filled and mainly by the scrub nurses here to <clears throat> make sure that the counts of the instrument and sharps and swaps are correct and documented. Uh, also to uh, identify if any specimen being taken and the forms are filled, operating notes uh, <clears throat> being done. Uh, and the handover uh, to the Anissa uh, theater being done as well. So this is very important to avoid uh, mistakes, uh, <clears throat> make the journey safe for the patient during his stay in the operating room. Uh, <clears throat> the Second, the next thing is the theater ICU handover sheet. And this should, uh, should be done either in theater or an ICU. A handover between the team, the anesthetic team with the intensive care unit team it should be verbal, handover, and a written form as well. Again, uh, <clears throat> documentation of the details of the patient, uh, including uh, risk factors of the patient, uh, ejection fraction, creatinine, air lines, uh, uh, lines inserted, either arterial or central and its location, operation done, any, any intraoperative complication, uh, chest drains, <clears throat> and urinary catheters, uh, basing wires, all that should be documented. Also, um, the urine output, last hemoglobin, uh, blood transfused, blood and blood product transfused, last ABG, uh, condition of uh, endotracheal tube, uh, uh, infusion of drugs, uh, labeled and uh, rate of infusion. Also, uh, should be discussed the planning of the patient in terms of extubation, rate of inotropes, desired uh, <clears throat> Uh, blood and central venous line and fluid balance, any needed immediately post uh, uh, discharge from the theater investigation like ECG, chest X-ray uh, or echo uh, should be documented in the notes. <clears throat> Continuing with the process, also we have evidence that um, continuing aspirin, uh, for the elective cabbage to the time of surgery uh, is very beneficial to the patient. Stopping other antiplatelets five to seven days before surgery is, is also important. Uh, keeping uh, blood glucose below 180 in the perioperative period uh, is important. Uh, giving prophylactic antibiotic at time of induction using uh, ultrasound guided central line insertion, intraoperative transesophageal echo, uh, AB aortic ultrasound to assist ascending aorta, aortic calcification before applying your cross clamp or inserting your proximal uh, anastomosis, graft flow assessment intraoperatively uh, to assure that they, they are patent, arterial using arterial graft rather than venous graft, uh, repairing the mitral rather than replacing the mitral. Early aspirin for cabbage, uh, six hours after patient discharging and no bleeding. Early beta blocker, next morning uh, we should start the beta blocker. It decreases the, <clears throat> the risk of uh, cardiac rehabilitation programs and modification of risk factors. And this is again uh, a side and uh, a point which is uh, deficient uh, in Libya, uh, anticoagulant clinic and heart failure clinic. Again, we have problem with this as these clinics do, uh, does not exist and the burden of following up this patient 
especially anticoagulation lies on the surgical team. Uh, third point is the appropriateness of care. And this is uh, for the surgical team to adhere to the plan which is being laid out by uh, the heart team and guided by the society as doing extra unnecessary procedure uh, is, is not only uh, costly, but could be harmful to the patient as well. And this is important for uh, the health buyers, uh, this part of the quality. Outcome, <clears throat> this is uh, very important, and this is what we, what we do is to achieve uh, this desired outcome to have a patient who comes, uh, to have a good operation, uh, to improve his quality of life and his experience with interaction with the medical team. Outcome usually assists uh, during m, m meeting, but this is to discuss mortality and morbidity cases only. <coughs> Excuse me. But uh, the real outcome it will be assessed by uh, the registry. An outcome, uh, any outcome should be uh, documented or uh, followed. It has been <coughs> well defined. Uh, this is very important to standardize uh, uh, this uh, outcome. It has to be easily measured. Um, easily acquired, uh, easily validated, and robust. <clears throat> and I put a list of outcome, including uh, in hospital and 30 days uh, mortality, uh, reoperation uh, for any reason, uh, stroke, duration of ventilation and reintubation, uh, renal failure, uh, deep sternal wound infection, ICU and hospital stay, readmission for any reason, functional status and patient satisfaction. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in hospital mortality is uh, is hard endpoint. It, uh, it has all the specification of good outcome we spoken about. Uh, <coughs> functional status and patient satisfaction becoming recently more important as we have more uh, input from the patient about their experience and their functional states. <clears throat> and recently, uh, the STS database introduced this in terms of patient uh, reported outcome measurement. Efficiency, <clears throat> here we are talking about the number of operation done per year, number of operation done per operating, uh, uh, total operating time per theater, ICU and hospital stay. And this is, comes to the cost effectiveness and the health buyer will be uh, more interested in this outcome. <clears throat> uh, whose responsibility for improving the quality of care of this patient? Uh, everyone who uh, provides uh, payment or providing a care for the patient should be responsible. And uh, I divide them by our modules. Uh, and uh, if we're talking about the structure, health authority and building licensing authority, they are responsible to make sure that any health facility built up to standard and equipped with reasonable uh, equipment to provide the service intended for. Process. This is to do with us as health health uh, professions and hospital management managers to make sure that <clears throat> we do the right thing for the patient. Appropriateness, uh, uh, appropriateness of care. Uh, the health payer will be more interested to make sure that we do not do unnecessary um, intervention to the patient. Uh, outcome. Uh, here is the phys phys physicians and. Uh, professional society and health buyer are interested in this. Efficiency, uh, health buyer will be interested in that. <clears throat> so if we look here uh, as, as health profession, we are more inter, uh, concerned with 
the process and outcome because it, these are the modules which we can modify and we can make a change in it. Uh, the rest maybe is not in our hand, but we should be good uh, advocacy for health uh, equality in Burundi. Uh, cycle of equality, uh, cycle of uh, quality <clears throat> is very important to for us to uh, pay attention to this cycle as our uh, clinical trials and clinical registry uh, provide us with the clinical evidence of the best practice. And we have to remember that clinical registry contributing to all the levels of evidence we have, level A, B, C. Uh, uh, the societies uh, gather this evidence and summarize it as, as guidelines and <clears throat> highlight the important performance measures which we should do in our daily practice to improve the outcome. Uh, we make our uh, a contribution to that through the structure, uh, process, appropriateness of care, and to achieve uh, a good outcome at the end. If we look here, we, we can see the clinical registry is in the middle of the cycle and is very important component as it contributes to the, our clinical evidence. It captures our uh, performance measures and it can uh, give output in terms of how much we've done in that and also it contributes to the outcome. <clears throat> so to finish the to complete the cycle, clinical registry is very important element of that cycle. Uh, <clears throat> if we have any problem with the outcome in terms of uh, investigating any uh, outlier in terms of a unit, operating unit, usually the investigators will uh, start from below in this pyramid and goes up. Look at the data quality, make sure that there is no problem with the data in terms of definition, accuracy, uh, validation, then it will move to the patient case mix, making sure that uh, the outcome is risk adjusted. The, the third step to look at the structure and resources of the hospital, the, the bits we've spoken about, and then goes to the process in terms of uh, professional care and intervention done to the patient. And last thing, to investigate the carer, either, either the unit or the staff. <clears throat> uh, rule of clinical registry is very important in, uh, in policy planning in terms of uh, monitoring the trends in, in the real practice and, and any financial impact in the future. Uh, quality improvement in terms of performance assessment, <clears throat> health assist, healthcare assessment in terms of uh, uh, performance <clears throat> assessment and uh, 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 comparing the, day, the, the, the units and the outcome of it, governance, uh, research, as it, it's, it's, it can test uh, hypotheses and it can develop uh, risk assessment risk modeling as well uh, it's important for auditing and auditing here we have to audit the performance measures and this is for local in hospital uh, quality control not for publication but it can also audit that as it's risk adjusted and it can be publicized for uh, public and patient information Uh, the situation in Libya, <clears throat> as we have no clinical registry, we are missing half of the cycle of quality control. As we have the clinical evidence and the guidelines, but do we, uh, do we practice them? Uh, these guidelines, everyone will claim he, he does. <clears throat> but if we uh, capture these performance measures, will be surprised how much are we missing. Uh, what's outcome of our intervention? No one knows if you don't, if you don't have a clinical registry. 
here is comes the rule of clinical registry. The list on the left hand side of the screen, none of this will be available to you <clears throat> to improve your quality of care if you don't have clinical registry. Uh, most of uh, countries, they have clinical registry uh, <clears throat> uh, and famous ones, the STS and the UK database, adult cardiac surgery database and the European Association of Cardiothoracic Database. And these databases <clears throat> span over a couple of decades decades and have a million of records. And they publish uh, reports every <clears throat> five years or so uh, with the trend, with the outcome and highlighting uh, the, the good performance of the units to make sure that uh, other units uh, take us as uh, a guide for it. <coughs> uh, clinical registry, who, who's the stakeholder for it? Libyan Cardiac Society, uh, Ministry of Health, uh, hospitals, clinician and public, all uh, these intent uh, uh, are a stakeholder for the registry. And every one of these I, uh, should uh, contribute and should push to have a cardiac uh, cardiac surgery database. Uh, where does the finance come from? Uh, in Libya, uh, maybe good start is the Libyan Cardiac Society uh, and health buyer, Minister of Health and Health Insurance Company, and later maybe industrial companies can have contribution into that. As the, the major, uh, the big uh, Registry usually started by uh, uh, leader uh, physician who putting their data into it or starting uh, the trial and then move into uh, become a registry. But this is need a lot of resources, obviously, as we will see next. The challenges uh, faces uh, anyone who wants to establish a database First thing to have, I think I, 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 I missed to put that, to have an interest from the people who are using this database and have uh, <clears throat> to be convinced that it's very important. Otherwise, it, it, it won't be uh, taking off. Uh, you have to search for a software vendor, either overseas or local, uh, and if everyone, every, every one of these has its own uh, good and bad uh, points, you have a, to establish a data center, a server, where you, ha you house these data. You have to have an, an analytical team from a biostatistician and physician to look at these data, publish reported reports about this data, <clears throat> full-time stuff, and this is to maintain the database and as a data uh, manager in the hospital to make sure uh, the data is complete and uh, valid. Uh, you have to look at the current legislation in the country to make sure that you're not uh, in any violation of this legislation as you're gonna keep uh, this data and you will publish it. And if any legislation changes need to be done, you have to sort it out before starting this process. Uh, and last is data validation. And this is the biggest headache and very important without making sure that data is well validated. And this, there is many process to do that. The data will be a waste of time and money and effort and no one has a trust in it as it's not valid data. Uh, <clears throat> this is my recommendation. Where to start in Libya? Uh, if we're going to Follow that path, we have to uh, task force committee, which uh, people who are interested in this, to reach out to stakeholders to raise the awareness uh, of the importance of data uh, of the registry. And we have to draft solution for all the challenges and to communicate with the overseas national database committees and expertise in the field. And we have with us today, Dr. Uh, Peter, Walton, who will enlighten us more about this. 
uh, exploring potential sources of financial support. And this is very important. As there is, uh, uh, to start with, there is a cost and running uh, will be a cost as well. In 2014, we, uh, we reached out to uh, the uh, try uh, system in the UK seeking for uh, a, 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 a proposal for uh, to establish a cardiac regist uh, database in, in Benghazi Medical Center and hoping this will be a hub for a national uh, registry. And we had a couple of proposals uh, from Dr. Peter but because of the instability, uh, political instability and war, this effort was aborted very early. <clears throat> Following that, we I tried personally with one of the engineers to build uh, our own database. And uh, <clears throat> it took us quite a long time. Uh, it may, it may, it had, we had a lot of... Uh, time and effort put into this database and it captured uh, all the patients from uh, waiting list to admission, <clears throat> uh, operation, uh, discharge and follow up. And it has uh, 13 sections <clears throat> and every patient captured between 280 to 290 fields uh, depends on the type of surgery. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this database, personally, uh, I am putting the effort to enter this database. At one point, some of other team were doing that, uh, but now I'm doing it myself. Uh, built in into this database, uh, uh, a logistic Euroscore and Euroscore 2. And in this database, you can uh, <clears throat> search by uh, dates of surgery, uh, cardiac procedure done, uh, consultant responsible hospital. Uh, you can look at the mortality. <laughs> and here we're looking at in-hospital mortality, 30 days mortality, one year, five year mortality, uh, <clears throat> wound infection, duration of ventilation, uh, intercostal drainage, uh, blood and blood product transfusion, ICU and hospital stay. And obviously a lot of other uh, points being captured and you can search this database. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we'll talk later, maybe uh, Dr. Peter will talk about their own system and will light us uh, more about that. Uh, and this is uh, bring me to the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening. I hope I didn't uh, come over my time. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Omar. <coughs> Elegant presentation as expected. Um, we have the father of databases actually uh, uh, in the Western world, and I'm, I'm proud to uh, uh, invite uh, Peter Walton, who has kindly agreed to join us this evening, despite the fact that he's on travel, he's now in Dubai, and uh, he has experience with Libya since 2010. And we look forward to hear from him. We'll take it in the order of seniority. So, Peter, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And thank you for that uh, very interesting presentation. I think you've got all the right points about the, the, the need for a registry. Um, I'm, uh, as you know, the managing director of Dendrite, and I've had the honor to have set up the UK registry 27 years ago. I also set up the um, EAX registry and a number of other national registries around around the world. And I think the, the good news is it's a lot easier to do now because you you don't have to have a system in each hospital. You can run this on one central web registry. And that's how the majority of uh, national databases are now implemented around the world. Uh, and the other benefit of that is that you can make the registry automatically send a message to a patient so you're getting the patient reported outcome data back to the registry remotely so the patient can do this on from a smartphone and the other benefit is 
with an online system, you can have dynamic reporting and dynamic benchmarking along with you know the Vlad plots and QSUM plots. So you've got real time uh, outcome tracking. So I think you're, I think while obviously you're, you're disappointed that you've not got a registry started, there are benefits in, in, in having uh, weighted because it means that you can do it more cheaply, more co uh, cost effectively and more efficiently by going for a web registry now. It doesn't need to be Dendrite, it could be another company, but so there are benefits in, in your delay. <laughs> I hope that encourages you. <laughs> Thank you. How many countries now have the cardiac surgery database uh, from Dendrite, Peter? We've set up 175 registries around the world across a whole bunch of different specialties. Um, in, uh, I think we've set up six national registries. Um, uh, you, you may be aware of the Euromax LVAD registry that runs on Dendrite. And uh, we're running a, a cardiac trial called Myectis out of um, out of Greece. That's that's run multi-country on one single database system. Interesting. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think we we have Dr. Ibrahim Isbeda with us, and I hope that uh, his internet uh, is uh, cable. Ibrahim, the floor is yours. Brahim is a senior cardiac surgeon working in Tajura, and uh, he is, uh, I know, is working hard in Tajura. So it will be very important for us to hear from, uh, from his point of view. Brahim, are you with us? Dr. Zbeda. Assalamu alaikum. كان عندي صعوبة شوية ندخل في النت ندخل لل 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 زوم رغم إني بداية الزوم بدأت في ليبيا نير كان في يوم وقت الكورونا كنا ندرس أونلاين بالنسبة للرجسي أو حقيقة أنا ما عنديش ما عنديش بإكسبيرينس مش بنتكلم على هالموضوع ما عندناش في تجارة أي رجسي حقيقة عندنا كل ال الكلاسيك الفايل هذا وما عندناش حاجة يعني ما يعني ما فيش ما فيش ريجستر حقيقي في ارشيف عادي كلاسيك وخلاص طبعا مع الناس اللي تكلموا انه بيديروا ريجستر في ليبيا ونشد عليهم لكن ما ما عنديش اي حاجه في ليبيا واعتقد في كل المسيشات ما ما نشوفش في ريجستر حقيقي ممكن تقدر تطلع منه داتا حقيقيه في بن فما عنديش شيء انا جاي بسمعكم اكثر من متكلم يعني شكرا دكتور اريدا Ibrahim, shukran for konak uh, ma'ana liyum, barakallahu fiik. Adil Dayoub. Thank you, Rida, for the opportunity to participate in this and for the invite. Um, I think the this is what uh, I think was a very elegant and uh, fantastic uh, lecture, uh, Omar. I've seen this before during the meeting, and it was really, really one of the lectures that caught my eyes. And I think uh, even in the Western world, I practice in Canada, and the channels that you mentioned, they are real and they still exist even in the top big, big centers. Our centers does over 2000, almost 2000 cases. And we do not have a dedicated nurse to gather the, the, the database. There's an attempt since I was start. I think I was joined, joined the staff 14 years ago. There's a talk about joining the STS, but I'm telling you the costs are always an issue. The cost of one or two dedicated nurses to gather the information, to enter them, to collect the data, uh, that this is was a big, big hurdle in our center. So what ended up being, Cardiologist has their own, the Valve Clinic has their own, the Mitre Club has their own, uh, the, um, the hospital has their own. So everybody, it's actually very funny. This You can see all these fragmented databases, but I agree, uh, if you put your efforts in one, you can extract whatever you want. You want blood transfusion data, you want stroke data, readmission data, length of stay data. So I think for me, one of the biggest hurdle when we go into those meetings is the cost of who's collecting the data. Because Omar, you'll do it today and tomorrow, next month, you are not going to do it forever. You're gonna get busy unless you keep with this pace. But I think uh, the other thing is people saying, oh, okay, well, let's let the resident enter the data. So today is a BGY1, tomorrow is a BGY3. So you need to maintain the consistency. Otherwise, you're going to have very heterogeneous data quality. And the quality 
if you start talking about using these registry to you know extract and come up with some publication outcome you're going to have a lot of poor data so i think there is more push toward having consistent dedicated people which is the key um, i think those SDS database, and if you see them, are very detailed. If you if you print out the uh, thing, it's about 21 page. So if you tell me you're going to do it after each of your OR and monitor your patient, I'll tell you you do it one day, one week, and then, you know. So I think the importance of uh, of database is, is real. I think the challenges are there, and it's not only in Libya. They, they are in everywhere. And I give you an example in our location, our center. Um, I think the... Um, the other thing that I um, uh, I like from your talk is uh, is the um, especially with regard to the pro I think the process about the you know when you have these clinics and follow ups and our centers in the last four or five years for example you know the the hospital the Ministry of Health is always looking for measures or ways of reducing costs and especially in the cardiac surgery patients the cost comes from usually if you have a seven to eight readmission rate or 12% depending on where you, which you read. We found that in the last five years or so, they come up with a, this, these ideas of developing clinics. And uh, for example, there's AFib clinic, there's a wound, the wound infection clinics. Anybody who have infection, he calls this clinic or heart failure clinic, pool, pool injection fractions. There's also now our orthopedic clinic, any dissections, for example, any type A dissections, if you look at the, the way we practice, you repair him, you fix him, he goes to the society, nobody follows him, the, and rarely sometimes we hook him up to vascular. So now there's a dedicated surgeon who sees this patient with the CTs in six months to a year. So we follow the, the natural, so we see how they do. So I think uh, these are all measures to improve quality because um, I think your talk is all about quality. So I think you want to as much possible to prevent readmission, which is the drive, the major drive of, of, of cost. And I think um, uh, beside the, um, the, the the other point, uh, it used to be the only surgeon who had m, &M rounds. Now, in the last two, three years, we pushed every division that's related to cardiac surgery. So now we have intervention cardiologists having, imagine intervention cardiologists never had their m, &M rounds. Every m, &M rounds of cardiologists is mine or ours. So when they have a crash or perforated LED or patient who's crashing, it never shows up in any cardiology round. So after debates and after we've developed these hard teams, and I think they show the value because we present weekly our cases. So they agreed that they have monthly cases. We have even helped them to define what are the cases that you guys need to discuss in MM rounds. So there should be MM rounds in ICU, MM round in intervention and MM round in cardiac surgery. We do have combined rounds too. When we feel there is a, you know, there is a screw up or a contribution of each disciplined care, we should have the anesthesia who did the case, ICU intensivist, interventionist, and cardiac surgery. So in our centers, actually we're moving toward really, really hard team in discussing pre, post, and also, when it comes to patients' outcome, when if you have somebody with bad stroke or somebody who had really mostly mortalities, there's actually even more. Like there's now a team just developed last week, and they have this link, which is called the shock team. So I think cardiac surgery in the future, you know, you're gonna need a lot of mechanical assist, ECMO, this and this and that. So the more intervention you're gonna offer, the more documentation you need. So, um, and I say, I think uh, that this is a good opportunity. I, I agree with everybody that being that in Libya is, there's nothing, it's a golden opportunity if you get the support, if you get the authorities to have open-minded about it, it's going to be win-win <clears> to everybody <throat> because instead of just keep pouring money without knowing where it's going and what is the outcome of this, I think if you have something uh, that guide your guests or guide your budget, it would be much useful. So I think it's going to be at the end, win-win uh, to the patient, to the provider, and for the financing people. And I think uh, I'm going to stop here unless uh, we have, I have lots of notes, but I don't want to be, uh, I think, uh, for example, um, I'm going to mention something about the monitor for complications. For example, we review our cases and believe it or not, we don't have as a cardiac surgeon center a reliable way of assessing our graft flow intraoperatively. We use this stupid 
50 years instrument called Doppler, which just creates a noise. A lot of centers now, they use the mid-stem or which is measuring the, the graft flow. Um, brain protection, when you do our surgeries or dissections where you call the patient, we have no way of monitoring brain protection. And now there are so, some evidence accumulating about, you know, when you do uh, cool the patient, when you do a big uh, uh, R surgery. So I think there's a lot of areas. Maybe it's too early for this to be applied to Libya, but this is all, uh, I remember there was one of the cardiologists, he said, every cardiologist, when they stent anybody, they have an angiogram after they do their intervention to make sure the stent is working. You guys bypassing every day, there is no reliable way of checking your work. And I think relying on just gut feeling or your eyes to do the good anastomosis and stuff. I think this is uh, a 30, 40 years ways of thinking, but I think the modern era now it should be a much better way of, uh, I think the, to the topic and the talk could go on and on on <clears throat> so many aspects of care, but uh, I think um, this is uh, so nicely that you bring, to, bring it into a, a nice 40 minutes, but I think each slide could be a, a series of lectures itself. Thank you, Adil. Peter, with, uh, with cost in mind, please. Uh, I wanted to pick up on that point of the win-win, and I think uh, your comment's exactly right. With a registry, there's no doubt that you can improve outcomes and reduce complications and reduce um, adverse events, which eventually makes a registry cost, uh, cost negative. In other words, the... the um, you get more healthcare bang for your buck, as it were. And if you speak to the British surgeons, I think, was, am I right in thinking, Omar, you were at Harefield? Um, yes, a I was. surgeon who said to me, the mortality rate in the UK um, halved over an eight-year period, not because of dramatic change in practice, but because of the registry. Because you were tracking what you're doing, both there's both active audit and there's this thing called the Hawthorne effect. Um, that if you if you measure if you measure and audit what you do, you get better at it. So so there's no doubt that it's it's good for the patients, it's good for the surgeons, it's good for the payers, good for the governments. And as a result, we've had a number of uh, ministers of health contract with us directly to set up registries because they understand that benefit. That's point number one. The second point, which I think is also critically important, um, is this issue of the challenge of collecting data and i think you need to share it out it can't be the responsibility of just the the surgeon who owns the patient it should be the the junior that clerks the patient the surgeon ideally should put the data in immediately post-operatively as as um as bruce keogh the uh, uh, ex-president of the british society and ex-secretary general said the operation isn't finished when you put the last stitch in the operation is finished when you put the data into the database. And that way you've completed, you've completed the care. And then you have your registrars uh, put the data in uh, post-operatively and maybe a specialist nurse at the follow-up. And as I say, with the electronic method of the patient completing the proms remotely using um, a smartphone, the patient is also putting in the data for you. So there are ways around that challenge, but I, I certainly agree. The more patients you see, the more data there is to collect, but it's essential. And the, it, you have to decide that when you start a registry, there's no turning back. It's like a Rubicon moment. You have to, you have to commit to it. And I think you, all your comments and your talk are absolutely right. So, uh, Rida, I just want to comment on something, just to follow up with his comment. I think the... Um, one thing I found uh, initially was a very, very hesitancy among my colleagues, especially the surgeon, when the head of the division came back and he said, every three months, we're going to come back and show every surgeon mortality by person, by surgeon, by procedure, which is <clears throat> combined and valves. Forget about, you know, ASD or dissection or stuff. So all electives. So he said, I'm going to come and say, what is your mortality? What is your... And even gone even beyond that, and it's actually transfusion by plasma, by plated, by packed cells, by transfusion in the OR, by transfusion in the ICU. Initially, there was everybody like, you know, resistant that notion. But after first three, four, five couples of representation, you actually gonna see everybody start acting up, smartening up, trying to be more cautious, aware about transfusion, 
start, you know, measure implementing all sorts <clears> of measures, <throat> wrapping, the hemodilution, optimization pre-op. So we start, and that actually triggered a lot of things and now having a committee now called pre-op optimization uh, group that I'm actually one of the leader of this group. So I think when you think having data to present to your group, that mm-hmm. feedback is actually uh, will have a quite positive impact on practice. So those guys who had 48 and 46% transfusion for cabbage only, now they have a 36% five years later. So I think that's, that's, that's number one. And even now, each one comes to me and said, so why you guys only has your names on the transfusion? Why don't we have transfusion by anesthesia, by perfusionist, by intensivist who runs the week of the ICU? So I think if you actually dig more, you actually come up with more and more and more. I mean, it might be more too, too much work, but I think the more you let people accountable for their actions, the more they become aware and conscious and they start doing good action. Because you know what? I have one of my friends who is plated transfusion 67% per cabbages. That guy is now out of our practice. So the, 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 the benefit of having registry is also twofold. It actually will show you if one of your colleague, his cabbage mortality is six folds of yours, there's something wrong. And that's where you actually can come back and say, hey, why every m M&M and round is Omar? Why every m M&M and round is Rida's patient? And we never see the other guy's patient shows up in m M&M round. So that will raise a flag. You protect your patient. And you improve the quality of your outcome because everybody here, every year gets a letter says each center's mortality by procedure. If you are an outlier, you get a letter that says, guys, what's going on? Is it just every patient on Tecagrol, Plavix, and emergencies and balloon pump? Or you get, you have a sloppy surgeons? Watch out. And that happened to us. We have two people now off the staff position. From eight, we went down to six. So I think it's a, it's another use for the database and registry. Can I quickly pick up on Can that I... point? Because in, in the UK, um, that that's exactly what used to happen. It was very much surgeon focused, but there was a realization that surgeons were becoming risk averse. They were they, they were not operating on the high risk patients, who of course are the ones with most to gain because they're worried about their results. So there has been a move towards institutional outcomes, in terms of if you like uh, uh, publicizing results and only looking at surgeon results behind closed doors in that institution. And I think that's a sensible approach because it's the patient's outcome isn't just determined by the surgeon, is it? it's determined by the referral route. Um, who was the cardiologist that got that patient to you? As you, as you mentioned, uh, um, were, were they a salvage case? It's, it's how good is the anesthesia? How good is the intensive care? So I think the move towards institutional outcomes it is a pragmatic and a sensible sensible way forward. Can I, uh, Rida? I j- I just maybe to... we'll, we'll take some other comments, Omar, then you will have okay. the last one. Yeah. If you allow to meet Abdel Ghani, uh, please, Dr. Abdel Ghani Bunwara. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Salam. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Omar, and thank you, everybody, for this fantastic talk. I'm a cardiologist, so. I'll speak about the cardiology perspective here, uh, but definitely because of the collaboration and the close work between cardiologists and cardiac surgeons, I think it's very important that this data uh, be also collected according to cardiac surgery and also cardiologists should be involved to get the best outcome of this data. Um, Data collection and Validation is very, very important, but thankfully, as Dr. Peter mentioned here, that we have companies now that can help. So we shouldn't think too much about that as long as we have the infrastructure and the intention to do it and do it right, uh, with the, also involving everybody involved in this field and has to be across the country. So we shouldn't miss places where there are patients that might be involved. That way it will be collective and also uh, will be used internationally as a co- data from Libya. It's not only from a, one center. Uh, data information is very important for research. I myself uh, have done lots of um, research during my residency and practice. And the data collection when it's validated and clearly 
um, reflects the um, information from patients, then you can use it for research. And that adds up, adds up a lot to outcomes and adds a lot to the information comes and shows how good is the practice in that country. Finally, is it's a teamwork between cardiology and cardiac surgery. So we'll be happy to be involved as a cardiologist as to, uh, because we see patients before and after, as Dr. Peter mentioned early on, that a patient comes from cardiologists, then goes to the surgeon, then comes back to the cardiologist. And the, the uh, guidelines, um, treatments, and optimization of therapy is very important and has to be initiated very early on. Uh, I practice here in Canada, Dr. Dayoub is, uh, is very close a friend of mine and we share patients. So when the surgeon finish the surgery, usually you see patients within a couple of weeks. And that is very important step mm -hmm. to optimize everything and help the surgeon get the best outcome of the patient. Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I think uh, we have Ayman raise his hand. Maybe, yes. Uh, uh, last or one before last. Yes, thank you, Dr. Da. Thank you, Dr. Omar, for this uh, nice presentation. I think mm -hmm. you hit the nail on the head about like the importance of the quality assurance in cardiac surgery. I have a question to uh, 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 Dr. Walton, the rest of the group, uh, regarding uh, the, how, how would you convince a healthcare system or a hospital, cardiac surgeon, they're doing a surgery with the importance of the uh, quality assurance. Like when you present the data, what are the main thing that you want to make sure that you make it clear for any hospital, any healthcare system that you want to promote using the, the uh, uh, registry uh, to adopt it. And the cost, like, because a lot of people, they don't know how much this project uh, cost. So I would like to hear that from you. Thank you. I think, I think the, prime, the prime reason for a registry, and it's also the prime reason for being a doctor, is to improve outcomes of patients. Full stop. That's what it's about. And that should be the, that should be the aim of any healthcare system, any provider, and any anybody in any organisation that's delivering healthcare. It's all about improving outcomes for patients. It's as simple as that. Now, I remember also in the uh, '90s in the UK when the database first came out. I was uh, the society that has had a major say, the British Cardiac Surgery Society, had a major say on how should every institution take part in and uh, uh, contribute its outcome data to, to the society. Uh, that, of course, that was backed up with the government at some stage where you have to have some uh, uh, legislative ruling that will, will influence and, and support that. Uh, we have Nouria El Amami. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Rivas. Uh, good evening for everybody. I'm um, sorry, and I will talk about here uh, talking uh, in Arabic uh, because uh, my question is uh, relating uh, for the nursing, uh, just for uh, Dr. Riva. But before that, Shukran, uh, Dr. Omar, على المحاضرة الشيقة هذه واللي هي فتحت مجال النقاش. طبعاً أنتوا يعني صدق يعني أثريتوه. أنا بوينت الأولى في السلايد الأولى بخصوص السرتي في سرتيفايد ستاف. إذا كان إحنا تاون نشتغلوا على إن نحن نقول يور داتا كوليكشن الجود داتا كيسز موجودات عندنا في الشغل معناته إحنا عندنا ستاف وهو ما فيش سيرتيفايد معناها هي مش مشكلة الستاف أتمنى من الليبيا كاردك سوسايتي إنها تهتم إنها تقدر دي تريننج بروجرام على الزوم ولا يعني حتى يكون أونلاين إذا كان عايزين إن إحنا نديره يعني سيرتيفيكاس يعني هيك حتى شهادات يعني الإكسبيريس ستاف هذوما اللي هم لهم كم سنة فوق من 15-20 سنة يشتغلوا في الكاردياك سيرجري من نيرسينج ومن من البروبيوجينست وان هو يقدر يدير بروجرام للموضوع هذا تتبنى ليبيا كارد سوسايتي يدفعوا فيه الناس قيمه بسيطه لان نحن ابدا وسنظل دائما عايزين كجامعات ولا كليات ان نحن نخصصه ويجا ديما عندنا ايش نوع من استجما ان ديما ما عندناش سيرتيفايد ستاف ما عندنا عندنا اكسبيرتيز ستاف اشتغال على حتى 
شنو على الانيوريزم على الريدو كيسز على الامرجنسي على اول تايب اوف كارديك سيرجري انا اتمنى انه يتخذ الموضوع هذا بعين الاعتبار ونقدر انا ندير ليدنج بما بصفتي انا يعني زي ما تقول رئيس مجموعه التمريض الفنيين يعني في الليبيا كاردوك سوسايتي انا نطالب فيها بقوه لان هي محرجه جدا بعد ما يقولوا سيرتيف نو سيرتيفايد ستاف وهو اوريدي تو احنا نبحث عن داتا عشان نحفظ الكوليكشن هذين الداتا للشيء هذا وشكرا جزيلا لك معلش يعني الاضافه هذه يعني شكرا. Uh, I've just seen uh, Adil Dayoub waving. If you want to talk, please go ahead. You have 30 seconds. Um, just to uh, talk about um, the uh, database um, question to Peter and Rida, I think um, we don't want to be, you know, you have to stand, crawl before you stand and run. Is it possible to have a um, meaningful and useful database without having electronic health records? If we are going to be look on, uh, listening to Dr. Brahms Bailey earlier, he said we have what we have is a classic filing papers, handwritten, nobody probably able to read. Is that a meaningful way of, because I think to have a meaningful, good, useful database, you have to have a good electronic record. I think other than probably our region, if, if, you, if you look even in Gulf area, Saudi, Bahrain, every, the whole system is electronic. So electronic makes development of database easy. A lot of them, if you have the right software, it's actually you can extract data easily, especially, you know, when it comes to numbers, blood transfusions, you know, pump time, cross clamp time, all this, it's just all integrated. It actually makes your life easier. You. So that's, yeah. So the Thank other you. part, I, I, which is, I, which is like, I agree with you. It's easier to implement uh, the database if you have uh, HIS. However, databases started long before HIS were, uh, came to the market. Peter, in short, please. Then Ibrahim, then Omar will have the last last word in five minutes. Peter, one minute maximum. In our experience, we've we've set up what we call hybrid um, national registries that are taking data that's either being keyed in directly case by case, or has, has been sucked out of a his a his or an EPR system. So yes, you can accommodate both scenarios. Thank you, Ibrahim. Then Omar. Dr. Brahim is bathed. Father, unmute yourself. Database في نظري لو بنبدأ بها من الآن أنا أعتقد إنه كل مستشفى في كاردك سيرجري. Sorry, I am talking in in Arabic because I am French. Language my French language. يعني I cannot talk in all of you are. Actually, I was about to speak in Arabic, uh, by the way, hey, but uh, hey, hey. in this session, who well, doesn't speak Arabic is very speaker. is not so good. Hey. تمام. تمام. فأعتقد المسألة الرئيسية مثل لو جمعية القلب الليبية تتبنى هذا الموضوع رجسري ممكن يكون في أي مكان مش نبدو عمليين عمليين يعني ممكن يكون في كل مستشفى ونبدو بها حتى من الآن مثلا فايل فايل حتى سيمبل مهوش معقد أنا كانت عندي تجارب كبيرة على مستوى في الجامعة أو في الكلية في الامتحانات درت السيستم هذا ونجحت فيه إلى حد كبير بسمبل فايل فقط فلو كان في مثلا في بنغازي في مكان في كاردك سيرجي في سمبل فايل بتاع اكزل يا سيدي بسيط جدا تحطوا فيه الكريتيريا اللي تبوا تعرفوها مثلا اللي ذكرها بكري الدكتور عمر هذه الكريتيريا الفايل هذا وتقول للناس اللي موجودين يعبوا هذا الفايل فقط سمبلي از سمبلي از ذات وهذا الفايل بيكون عنده فايل ثاني اللي هو على مستوى جمعيه القلب الليبيه اللي هي يصير فيها الكولكشن اوف ذيس انفورميشن يو نيد ولا الداتا يو نيد اعتقد اف يو كانت يعني اف وي كان ستارت ذيس نقدر نقولوا نبدا في الـ في الـ في الداتا بيس شكرا لك ثانك يو جست بيفور عمر اي ثينك ذا كوست از نوت سو اكستورشنت اي ثينك اتس نوت really a great deal of money required to set up a database as far as remember from the proposal we had back in 2010. And I think Omar also had another proposal from Peter in 2014, which I'm not aware of, of the details of, but I, it's not really so bad to the point that we have to reinvent the wheel, um, at least from the government point of view. Omar, you have five to seven minutes, please. Uh, um, just wrap it up. Thank you. Okay, I will just uh, start from the point raised by uh, uh, Dr. Ibrahim. 
about using a simple Excel sheet. Um, some of the European country contribute uh, to the European Association of Cardiothoracic Database by sending uh, Excel sheets. Uh, so it's not a problem to do that. Uh, it can be done. Uh, but the point uh, is how, how much information you want. There is a, a very close relation. As you ask for more information, you have less accurate data. So, uh, and this, how much you're going to collect is very important and you have to think of it very early. You have to have a, a well-defined def well this uh, data you're going to collect because it will impact your, uh, uh, your validation and, uh, and uh, completeness and accuracy of your data. It can be done. Uh, and in the dendrite system I worked in the UK, uh, the required field is very few, but every hospital, they can add as much as they want for their own internal auditing or research. Uh, coming back to the point of data collection, I remember when I was resident in the UK, it was very tedious, very tough uh, to collect this data. As the data manager, and these, these usually, they are very dedicated people, very, very difficult to get these people because they put a lot, a lot of work, more than uh, the payment they receive. They just have the dedication to do their job. And they chase all the residents and they collect the files and show them the spreadsheet where the data is missing. And you have to spend hours over the weekend or after the working hours to scroll through the, the file to collect this data so it was very, very, very bad. But looking at our experience recently, uh, having a, 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 a protocol where you put prospectively this data into it and filling this data on the time by each subject, the surgeon after his operation, the pre-admission clinic uh, by the junior, uh, the intensivists fill the, their part in the ICU, it will make it, it make it easy. But again, it needs someone who to, a data manager, someone who is paid, who is dedicated to make sure this data is accurate. And validation is a big topic, uh, very tough to talk about, but we're not gonna go through that. Um, again, the, 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 the financing of the database, if we link uh, payment by result, and uh, this will be interested to the health payers and uh, insurance company. Whoever contribute to this uh, database will have a uh, better, uh, I mean, re reimbursement by, by the, these companies. And this should, and this is indirectly will uh, uh, dilute the cost and pay back to the hospital the, the, the payment for the data manager. Uh, I think that's all. Uh, thank you very much. Reda, we can't hear you. 